morning. Let's open in prayer, please. Lord, you are gracious and kind, powerful and mighty. We ask, Lord, that this morning your word would be made clear, Lord, through the message you have uh, given me, Lord, but not for, for me, Lord, but for all of us and for your kingdom and your glory. And we ask that you would, uh, Spirit would be working in our hearts and our minds to help us understand what it is you have to speak to us through your word, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Legends, myths, old and ancient stories, they capture our imagination perhaps even inspire us. One of the most famous is King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Amongst them is men of one of great knights of Camelot, Sir Lancelot, a noble and chivalrous knight. Such stories capture our imaginations. Perhaps that is why there are so many movies, books, cartoons, and TV shows about King Arthur. One famous book is called The Once and Future King. Doesn't that sound like a a mighty and powerful story, perhaps you've read it. Don't we then begin to look for such modern day kings and knights like Arthur and Lancelot, the just and good king, to restore justice to the land? Well, if you know the story, it begins fairly well and, and kind of pretty interesting. There's a sword in the stone and Arthur finds himself in London and somehow he, uh, decides he's going to try to pull this sword from the stone. He's missing one. He's just a squire bringing it to his knight. And he is able to pull this sword from the stone. No one else was able to. It shows that he's the worthy person, the worthy king that will be the next king. And, of course, as the story goes on, he fights for for what's right as opposed to might-making right or just a strong and cruel king. He's benevolent. He's good. He goes on many adventures. Championing the common people's plight, his kingdom and reign hold so much promise and potential. But if you know this story, it doesn't really end very well. It sort of ends badly, actually. Arthur, his wife Guinevere, commits adultery with the king's most trusted knight, Lancelot. Not really a good way to go about things. The kingdom falls into disarray and civil war, and thus ends the glorious tale of the legend of King Arthur. And this is where I'm going this morning. Are not these the stories that we look to? That one man or woman will bring us the help that we need and seek? My point is, where do you look for our help? Where are you looking? Are we looking to the world, a brave and noble modern day knight? Are we looking to ourselves? Or are we looking to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth? And his son, our help, who is our ultimate salvation. If we do, he will, keep, he will be our keeper and savior forever. Do you see? Psalm 121 is going to ask the exact same question. From where does your help come from? So if you would turn to me to Psalm 121. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 516. Psalms is roughly the middle, maybe slightly to the left, depending on how much stuff you got at the end there. The three points of my sermon this morning are, the Lord is your Savior, the Lord is your Keeper, and the Lord is your guardian. Follow along as I read Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So look at the psalmist's question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? So let me ask, are these hills of safety, of deliverance, Or are they representative of us longing for some help from earthly power or strength? From where do you look in times of trouble, hardships, health difficulties, adversity, or depression? Are we not often inclined to seek it from anything but God? We look to our friends. We text them or call them. Perhaps we post our problem on social media, seeking advice from someone who may point us in the right direction. We read some inspirational quote on Pinterest. 
Maybe the advice from some sort of professional to talk to someone, someone I might add, who is as sinful as we are. We go and then compare advice and talk with our friends offline too. It can be bewildering, contradictory, and sometimes downright crazy. Then we go and research these solutions on the internet. We check out WebMD or some blog or website, going from link to link, trying to make sense of the myriad of pages of seemingly expert advice online. Perhaps we consult our own experiences. We say, this reminds me of this time when this happened, or maybe our friend's or family's experience. We may even seek Christian advice through Christian brothers and sisters. But do we seek God first? Do we seek him? Do we seek him alone? As the text says, he is the creator of all things. Now, it is not that we should not seek good counsel, but we should lift our eyes up to the Lord first and foremost. Not look up to supposedly earthly wisdom by the hills or mountains, meaning whatever is great or excellent in the world, what appears strong, sound, firm. Instead, look to the maker of the mountains. Remember what Paul says in Romans. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Is that not what we do? When we seek our help in anything else but God, we worship, we give glory to the created and to the things they make, like websites, friends, blogs, each other, ourselves, or earthly institutions, government, education. We ought to consider such worldly greatness and excellence as what it is, nothing compared to our true and mighty help. God, through Christ, offers us the help we need. We need to look to God's unchanging promises, his immutable character, his holiness, his steadfast love, his providence, his control of all things, since all things move and have their being in him, as it says in Acts. Then, instead of looking up, do we look down? Down to ourselves, as some say, do we start to navel gaze? Or do we sit here and wallow in our misery? The world seeks to tell us that we should be our own guide, so we say, I will just work harder, longer, more diligently. We need to look within, dig deeper, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. Maybe, if I can just get that raise, that promotion, some sort of certification, then I'll be okay. Then I can relax and not be so stressed. I remember when Molly and Madeline were into American Girl dolls, my two, da my two daughters, and the, dolls company, the doll company slogan was, follow your inner star. <laughs> well, isn't that the problem? We are sinful creatures, so to follow our inner star will only lead to death and destruction, to eternal separation. How was, how was that worked out for you? Looking to your inner star. We need to look up outside of ourselves to the hills. From where does my help come? I lift up my eyes to the hills, which is fully revealed in Christ, the whole point of the gospel. Look to Christ and him alone. Yes, we turn our eyes in every direction. It's a problem for all of us. We need to constant and regular redirection. It reminds me when Caleb was a kid, and we had this backyard, and if you went inside for a second to get the phone, boom, he's gone, down the, this neighbor's house or that neighbor's house. Forget going shopping with him. He always wandered off. But are we the ones who are not to look to ourselves, to earthly powers, or give in to fear? Instead, we are to look to Christ. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews is encouraging us to look up, but not to earthly powers, and certainly not to ourselves, but look to Christ. Lay aside every weight and sin that clings to us. By faith in God, we will then be directed back to God, to exclusively to him. It is like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. He's lugging his burden. When he finally lays it at the cross, he is free, free of the guilt and consequences of his sin. And think of what we appeal to for help. The psalmist asks, 
Where does my help come from? From the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So look to the Lord. Now think about the power behind the description, who made heaven and earth. The creator and sustainer of the world. That is the one to whom we should look for help. The one we, who brought the universe out of nothing. He spoke, and it's there. Now, it is hard to comprehend nothing, but our God, he spoke, and it was done. And we are to look to him. Think of the creative energy that designed and brought forth all that we see and know. And, of course, more than we can see or know. It is almost off-the-cuff remark. Oh, he just made heaven and earth. But yet, it is not off the cuff. It is crucial. It is foundational. It gives credibility and power to the one who we should look to. After all, he made, he created heaven and earth. And if he created heaven and earth, how much more will he be able to save us completely? Now turn with me over to Isaiah chapter 40. Here, Isaiah describes God as all-knowing, omniscient. Listen as I read and think about the God to whom we should look, starting in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts it for for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like them, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Now recognize that Isaiah is talking about the stars here. And think about a God who created the stars, puts them in place. He numbers them and names them. Then do we get this? According to astronomers, there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. That means there are a total number of stars, and wait, 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 there's actually there's even more. There's 125 billion galaxies in the universe. That means if you add up all of this stuff, which I can't do, the stars is 1 times 10 to the 22nd, or 10 billion trillions, just of stars. Then God, the all-knowing God, he names every single one, and he ensures that not one is missing. (laughs) Meanwhile, we can't even remember where we left our keys. How about when you look for your glasses and they're sitting on top of your head? Clearly, God is all-knowing. And so why shouldn't we look to him? But God is also all-powerful. In fact, turn with me to Job chapter 38, back to the left, and listen to the power of God. So Job 38. just before Psalms. Job 
starting in verse 4. And, and God is addressing Job, and by extension us. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst out of from the womb? When I made clouds its garments, and thick darkness its swaddling bands, and preached limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther. And here shall you proud ways be stayed. You see it? God speaks to the oceans. And do you see what he says? Thus far shall you go, and no farther. It doesn't work when I speak to the ocean. Have you witnessed the power and destruction of, the wa of, of water? My parents live down in the coast of Rhode Island. Now, we've seen some of its power to destroy houses, move concrete, wipe away whole sections of land. But it is God who commands and controls it. Continuing, God asks Job in verse 34, Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are, who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clouds stick fast together? And what is Job going to say to all these questions? What would you say? No, of course not. Not me, but God has. Why? Because he is all-powerful. So God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, is also all places. Let's turn back to Psalms. Get a little preview for next week in chapter uh, 139. Chapter 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, where shall I free from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Do you hear what he's saying? There is nowhere you can run to get away from God. Why? Because he is in all places. So God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all places. But he is also holy, just, eternal, merciful, loving, glorious, and beautiful. So what's the point? If God is all these things, and we have barely scratched the surface of who he is, why would you look anywhere else for your help? So we are warned not to look to earthly, created things for our help. Instead, look to him who created the earth and all that is in it. In some sense, we attempt to dethrone God as the creator of the universe when we look elsewhere. We don't acknowledge him that he, we don't acknowledge him that he holds the whole world in his hands. Indeed, he holds the entire universe in his hands. Yet, we get caught up in our fleshly passions, especially when there is immediate danger or trials or hardships. We fall back into our old ways. We look to earthly powers. We look to our own power. But by doing so, we defraud God of the universe. We defraud the God of the universe. As we look to the hills, remember we ought to only seek help and safety from God alone. Now, to be perfectly clear, as we look to the New Testament next, we recognize that ultimately it is through Christ that we gain the help we need. Just think about what Colossians says: "For by Him, Christ, that is, all things were created in heaven and in earth." visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So God, through Christ, created the universe. So God, through Christ, is our helper. And it is the help we need if we knew what was best for us. He will meet us on the road. He will not fail. He is never late, and he is always sufficient for all of our needs. 
he, Christ, is able to save us to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through Christ, as it says in Hebrews. Furthermore, as 2 Corinthians makes clear, the same God who said, let there be light, has shown himself through Jesus. Listen to what it says. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. True and complete help only come from outside of ourselves, outside of mankind, not in politics and health and fitness or science or medicine, in some self-help book or inspirational speaker or worldly success. It is found in Christ alone, through faith alone. Clearly looking up to worldly powers or ourselves is not and will not work. Look to the Lord who made heaven and earth. Remember what Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And as I just made clear, it is through Christ that we gain our help. So I ask, why would you not put your trust in Christ? He is the author of salvation. He alone can save. Nothing else, no earthly powers, no strength of man, no king of legend, no politician of today. Perhaps you've heard a little bit about the Supreme Court justice nomination going on. Do we put our hope in some Supreme Court justice that the right person will be on the bench to overturn some law that man has made and we know it can be overturned just again? Do we look to a governor, the right governor, to fix our fiscal woes here in the state? No. Science doesn't have the answers. Perhaps they can extend life for a few years, but they can't save your soul. As a matter of fact, I've heard some recent statistics that our lifespan is actually sh shrinking here in America. Why would you go anywhere else? God is the one who is all-knowing, all-powerful in all places. Don't you think he would know how to save us? And for eternity? God, through faith in Christ, not in ourselves or earthly, earthly powers, is able to save us to the uttermost, to save us completely. And if you put your trust in Christ and sought your help from God through Christ, then, as my second point states, the Lord is your keeper. Listen again to verses 3 and 4. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps Israel will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Down the street from where I grew up was this little pond called Hidden Valley. It was within walking distance. One time, my younger brother and I, I'm not sure if my parents know this story or not, but <laughs> if they're here. <laughs> um, so we go down with my neighbors, Richard and Stephen, to this pond. It's late February, March, I don't remember, but probably wasn't the best time to be walking on the ice. But it was slushy, and it was more or less solid. We were skinny little kids. Um, and there's a little island there, so we slush our way out there and goof off as a bunch of boys would. Um, and at one point, we decided it's time to come back. Well, we start walking back, and next thing you know, we get towards the edge of the uh, shore. <laughs> the ice starts to break, and we fall in. That wasn't that deep. We fall into our knees, and our boots get all wet. Well, we get out, and we come out, and now all of a sudden, we realize my younger brother is still out on the island. <laughs> and he's carrying on and crying, help me, help me. We're like, we're not going out there. <laughs> um, he did managed to get out because we did see him this summer so I was thinking maybe that's why he lives in California now um, clearly having a firm footing and firm ground and knowing where and what not to walk on is key as the story illustrates metaphorically what the psalmist is also talking about metaphorically it's an illustration for our life he will not let your foot be moved both a promise and a prediction we are very weak in ourselves aren't we Let's be honest, we're frail creatures. We're a breath, a vapor. I'm now 45 years old. It seems like it takes longer for me to recover from being sore, thrown out my back several times. And uh, despite I eat better, I exercise more, but yet I sometimes wake up with more aches than I went to bed with. Maybe some of you can identify with that. The point is we are physically ailing. How quickly can life take a turn and show us this? Now, what about our ability to keep ourselves on the narrow path of salvation? We're completely incapable, which is why the Lord keeping our foot from being moved is so necessary and reassuring. God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all places, can clearly hold us the most weak and feeble amongst us. So we are 
So as we grow in being sanctified, we do not move to our peril since God is keeping our feet from slipping as we walk this journey. Now we know we need sleep. Some of us more, some of us less. But it's a fact of life that we need to sleep. Perhaps it is hard to comprehend that God needs none. Behold, states verse 4, listen up. This is important. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Just think on that for a second. He doesn't doze off like a Sunday afternoon nap, nor does he collapse into a deep and sound sleep of exhaustion because he doesn't need to. He does not tire or get worn out. He has the bandwidth. He has the capacity. Remember, he is all-powerful, all-knowing in all places. Look at the promise in verse 3 because it's to the individual. Whereas, verse 4 is for all of Israel, meaning all who are called by him and respond to his call will be kept by God. That this blessing, this promise, is for the entire church. We should cling to such promises and remind ourselves of them. And think on that word, keep. The Lord, the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, he is the one keeping you. With such a God, we can walk this journey to its completion without fear. But we have to be careful here. This isn't some sort of let God, let go and let God type of thing here. His point is just a metaphor for our life. We still have to walk the path that is set before us. Get out of bed, go to work or school, or take care of our family. As I read earlier in Hebrews, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In the everyday living we do, though, God has given us the tools to keep us firm. While he watches us, namely the everyday means of grace. Nothing extraordinary but yet it kind of is. He's given us his word. He's given us our weekly worship service, our life groups, our Bible studies, meeting with other believers, prayer meetings and other gatherings. But do we put them into practice? Do we expect God just simply to pick us up and put us onto the next path? Of course not. He allows the struggle because he knows what's good for us. As Paul says in Philippians, therefore, my beloved, As you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So how do we do that? How do we work out our salvation? This isn't earning it, but in response to it. Well, one thing is we spend time in the Word. Take Take a look at Psalm 119, verses 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart. Further in Psalm 119 and verse 105, the word is a guide for our life. The word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He is giving us the means not to let our foot slip on life's journey. Now listen to Psalm 1. You can turn there next where the blessed man, the man who puts his trust in Christ, is encouraged to delight in God's law because his commands are not burdensome. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Notice the prospering is for the benefit of others. Fruit isn't for the tree, and prospering is not necessarily materialistic either. So as we continue to meditate on the law, the Lord is keeping you. In fact, look at verse 5, back in Psalm 121. It states, The Lord is your keeper. A simple statement. Yet what a concept. What a humbling thought. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord Almighty. That he would actually condescend to keep watch over us. And I use that word intentionally. It is condescending of him to stoop to be our helper. He is infinitely greater than holier than we are. Do you get that? Infinitely more. Yet he still stoops to take on this task that the Lord, in the person of Jesus Christ, has taken on this for those whom he has favored. K. 
can we put this truth, this promise into practice, into our lives? If we do, if we can, what a place to be. We would not need to fear the journey. We would be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Or as Psalm 1 states, we'd be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Despite the circumstances around us, we are grounded and nourished by his word, by the Lord himself through Christ. He knows you and cares for you and watches over you personally. Remember, he knows all things. The same God who knit you together in your mother's womb watches over you and keeps you. The promise of the Lord's actual protection. Like our shadow that is always with us, so is the Lord at our right hand. Meaning he is walking with us while we still face trials. Listen to 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the promise is not that we, ought, that we won't face difficulties, but that God will be with us, watching over us, keeping us during these trials and tests. Now as Psalm 121 continues, it states, The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night, encompassing both day and night, that the Lord will preserve us from excessive heat or excessive cold, all day long and all night long. We see here our keeper is protecting us spiritually from the evils of prosperity and adversity. Again, it is not that we will not face such challenges. God has not created some new sun and new moon for his saints to walk in. We exist under the same outward circumstances as anyone else. So speaking of the sun, reminds me when we went to the beach this summer, and uh, my wife was always admonishing us to put on suntan lotion, and of course to reapply. Well, I did comply for the initial application, but maybe I neglected to reapply, and we hadn't been out in the sun very much. Well, you guessed it, of course, I got burned, and uh, maybe the kids remember this, but they were laughing at me because I was shining like a lobster. Do we expect God to somehow not let us get burned like that? Of course not. We still live in the same world as we did before we came to faith. In the same way, if we don't take the time to read the word, to come to church, to hear the word preached and other means of ordinary grace, to be involved in working out our salvation, we too will get burned. And it doesn't feel good. But while we do, in, while we do live in the same world, God promises to be with us so as we live out our lives under, very very under varied and sometimes difficult circumstances, we can be assured that he is our keeper. He will keep us firm. He will not slumber. He will protect us. But again, not in ourselves, but in Christ and his power as we look to the Lord as our Savior. Now my third point is the Lord will be your guardian forever, for eternity. Look at verse 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Here we read in verse 7 that God will keep us from evil. But not just some evil, all evil. This is really getting to the heart of the matter. Verses 3 and 6 talked of physical dangers. But now the text turns to evils, all evils. He will guard us from from. And as the psalmist continues, it is the protection of our life, our very souls. And if he keeps our very lives, our very souls, all of us is kept, and not just from some evil, but all evils. Again, don't mistake that we will avoid facing hardships and struggles. Peter says in chapter 4 of his first letter, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Remember, the all-knowing, all-powerful, 
powerful all places creator. And we can entrust ourselves to God because he has promised to keep our lives. He knows what he is doing, even if we don't see it. Remember, uh, Paul makes this clear. Listen to what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So you see, Paul is facing hardships. Yet listen to what he says just a few verses later. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Now he's saying that while he is in prison, about to be executed, and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom, to him be the glory forever and ever. That is the point. The Lord will bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom, an eternal kingdom. So we need an eternal perspective. That, it, that is what is ultimately meant by keeping, being kept by our Lord. So we can be confident to do his will and be bold for his kingdom and glory. But don't think that this is just the evil from without. What about the evil from within? As the saying goes, we have met the enemy and he is us. Remember what Jesus said. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. So again, the encouragement is to work out our salvation, not earning it, but in response to God rescuing us from our sins, from ourselves. So let us spur one another on to loving good deeds. Let us pray without ceasing. Let us confess our sins to a faithful and just creator. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us not give up meditating on his word. Spurgeon says, God is the soul keeper of the soul. Our soul is kept from the dominion of sin, the infection of error, the crush of despondency, the puffing up of pride, kept from the world, the flesh, and the devil, kept for holier and greater things, kept in the love of God, kept unto the eternal kingdom and glory. What can harm a soul that is kept of the Lord? We need rescuing from ourselves too. When things are going well, maybe especially when things are going well with us. Abundance of friends and helper at hand. Job is good. The paycheck is plentiful. For surely then, we are in most danger of trusting in ourselves, our flesh, and thus reaping its curse. Or else saying to your soul, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But what did God say to him? Fool, this night your soul is required of you. Psalm 121 ends by saying, The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. What consoling words. He will keep us forever. The Lord of heaven and earth, he will be our protector. He will be our guardian. As Paul reminds us in Romans 8. Why don't we turn to it? Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 35. familiar verse to many of us. He will be our guardian. Chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. From the love of God who promised to be our keeper. So we have three choices. We can look to the world, to ourselves, or to the Lord. Where does your help come from? You can look to yourself, your own counsel, your own advice, through your own work or, your, or work of others. You can look to the world, to some modern day knight in shining armor. We know how that turned out. King Arthur is only a legend, long dead. Some historians even question if he even existed. But just like people in King Arthur's story, do you look to the government 
or the right Supreme Court justice, as I said earlier? Do we look to some educational attainment to be our salvation? Or do you look to Christ? Lift your eyes off of yourself and look to the Lord God Almighty. He is able to save you. There will be an end to this journey, an end to our life. There is a final destination, and there are two options. Life with your Creator through Christ, or eternal separation. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Lord, to the Father, except through Him. You deny the reality when you don't look to God for help. When you're driving and you're lost, you first have to acknowledge that you are lost. You need to recognize that you are sinful. You need to give up your pride thinking that you know better. God alone is the all-knowing. You need to seek help. Again, giving up pride that you can't do it. Christ is able to save us. And then, of course, you need to turn around. You need to repent and get on the right path. By faith in Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Life is short. You seem like you will live forever. You are in your prime, that you are flourishing. But soon it will be gone. For we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Caleb likes to make sandcastles on the beach. And when we go back and we go down to my parents, he builds these sandcastles. Of course, we're surprised if they're there the next day. Wind, the ocean, kids. Don't build your house on the sand. Build it on the firm foundation of Christ. Like the sandcastle, anything else, it will be gone. Not even a memory. Build your house and find your salvation in the solid rock of Christ. Now, Psalm 121 is a great encouragement for us who believe. We are reminded that we serve a God who made the heavens and the earth, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-places God, who does not slumber. He is always vigilant to watch and guide us. He is always with us, and he will guard our very souls. As First Peter, as, he, as I read in First Peter, he is guarding us through faith, for what? An imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance. The salvation of our souls. So we can walk boldly because you don't trust in yourselves. We can live confidently for what God has created us to, do, us to do. Proclaim his kingdom and to grow in our faith with him. Here a proclamation. We say to know Christ and to make him known. It reminds me of the Great Commission. Je Jesus saved us not only to restore our relationship with him, with the Creator, but also for good works, like proclaiming His kingdom. And as Jesus said, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you bow your heads and pray with me. From where does my help come, Lord? It comes from you. Only you, Lord. I ask that you would help us to lift our eyes off of earthly powers and earthly things and help us to lift our eyes off of ourselves. But look to you, Lord, for you are powerful. You are all-knowing and all-powerful in all places. You are able to save us completely. Help us to walk boldly in that promise for those who believe. And for those who do not believe, Lord, help them to see that only in you is true and complete salvation found, Lord. Only in you can we find our help. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.